Oh, good morning. It's good to see you. Would you open your Bible, please, to the book of 2 Kings chapter 22. 2 Kings chapter 22. I so appreciate the ministry of this church. I appreciate the fact that you have a, you have a church that as far as its stand, as far as its philosophy, as far as its doctrine is concerned, has not changed. Pastor, I can't say that about some of the churches that, that I've been in. 2003, I, was, I had not been in evangelism for a full year when I came, I believe it was in the month of March, to this church. And so this church has been, uh, it, it's really meant a lot to me. And a whole lot of churches that I was in in 2003, I could not return to today, mostly because they wouldn't invite me. I, my kind of ministry is not what they're trying to, to go after, but it is just a, a real joy and a privilege to be here. 2 Kings chapter 22 is where we will be. 2 Kings chapter 22 is a story, part of the story that is, of the life of a young king by the name of Josiah. He was made king at the age of eight. Now, I don't know any eight-year-old that's ready to be king, okay? But that's what happened with Josiah. That all happened because his grandfather was a wicked man and his father was a wicked man and so forth. And so here you have the story of Josiah. Now, we'll not look at a lot of it, but understand that there was something that happened in Josiah's life that made all the difference for him. And that was a decision that he made while he was young. That decision was, I will do right in the sight of the Lord. And that decision was significant because it represented a change from everything his family had done before him. But he decided, I'm going to do what is right in the sight of God. That transformed his entire life. Now, let me have you also remember that when he decided to do right in the sight of God, one of the things that he did immediately was to make the house of God a priority. Now, in the days of his father, in the days of his grandfather, uh, the house of God had not been a priority. As a matter of fact, by the time Josiah became king, nobody had been in the house of God for a long time. I mean, they hadn't been in the house of God really to do anything. So much so that when Josiah gave the, the order to clean it out, they had to go in there and there was the dust of years. There was, a, I'm assuming as we call it in Mississippi, there were probably critters in there, or probably mice, probably rats, who knows what else. And so before the house of God could even be used for the temple worship, they had to go in and just clean it out and get everything ready. I mean, it was, a, it was a church work day like nothing you've ever seen, I promise you, okay? And I understand it wasn't the church, but you understand what I'm saying. So they went in and they cleaned out everything in the house of God. There had been kings of Judah in days gone by that had erected pagan, a pagan altar in the house of God. And they had, uh, they had the, the normal altar in, in the temple, but then they had their own pagan altar. So all of that had to be cleaned up. All of that mess, all of that just had to be, it had to be set to right. And in that process, the men who were doing the cleaning found the, the scriptures. As a matter of fact, they came to Josiah and they said, I have found the book. Now, what book was he talking about? Well, he was talking about the book of books. He was talking about the Bible. In cleaning out the temple, they had encountered the scriptures. Now, the scriptures had been there all the time, but no one had read them. No one had paid them any attention. No one had looked at them. And so there they sat in amongst the rubble and the, all of, the, all of the, the rubbish of the temple of God. And so they brought that out to Josiah. Josiah and all the court read in the book of the, house, of, of the law that they had gotten from the house of God. So here's what they found. My life, Josiah realized, and God's word don't match up. And so, Josiah was called upon to make a decision. Now understand, when we come to the Word of God, there will be times when the Word of God provides comfort for you and me. There will be times when it provides guidance for you and me. But there will be times, make no mistake, that the Word of God will provide correction for you and for me. According to 2 Timothy 3 and verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. And one of the things for which this word of God is profitable is correction. It's also profitable for reproof, for rebuke, 
for instruction. All of those things are, are part of it so that when you and I come to the Word of God, there will be times when your life and the Word of God don't match up. So here's the question. When those times occur in your life and in mine, when I discover that my life and the Bible don't match up, how do I respond? That, my friend, is what we want to look at in Sunday school this morning. And uh, we need to understand that that difference, what, what, what we do when my life doesn't match the Word of God, that makes all the difference in the world between a life of growth and a life of Christian stagnation. So here we have a man whose life didn't match up with the Scripture. Now, he did something very important. He sent to a prophetess, all right? Now, you could corner me in the back of this auditorium and ask me some questions about why Josiah went to a woman instead of a man, and I wouldn't be able to answer those questions. I would just defer to your pastor, who is a far more erudite scholar than I. But uh, the truth of the matter is, they went to this woman by the name of Huldah the prophetess. The Bible says she was the keeper of the wardrobe. She dwelt in the college. And so, Josiah wanted more information as to what, what he was supposed to do, what was going to go on, because my life doesn't match up with the book. What does that all mean? I need some help on this. And so the Bible says in 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 15, this is the prophetess's answer. Notice what it says. And she said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Tell the man that sent you to me, thus saith the Lord. Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods, that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, As touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place, and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes, and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Now, I want us to focus this morning in the Sunday school time on verse 19. Notice what it says, because thine heart was tender. From time to time, my mother-in-law comes to spend time with us. Typically, it's around Thanksgiving. Uh, we come off the road the, month, the week of Thanksgiving. We're typically not traveling then, usually not a whole lot of revival meetings that are being scheduled the week of Thanksgiving. So she and her husband will come to our home, and they'll, stay, they'll spend some time with us. Now, my mother-in-law is a very strong woman. She's had to endure just tremendous hardships. Um, I, I, I can't go into all the details because time would not allow us this morning, but she, her first husband has passed away, and there was just a lot going on with that, and uh, she's learned to be a, a great prayer warrior. She's learned to be a great soul winner over the years, but there is a significant difference between my mother-in-law and our family. My mother-in-law loves films. She loves movies, but her taste in movies are not quite the same as our family's taste in movies. For example, my mother-in-law loves Hallmark Channel movies. And I don't know how much you know about Hallmark Channel movies, but they're just not, my, they're just not for me. They're, they're just not, okay? And some people love them, and that's fine. God bless you. But I could, if you have the Hallmark Channel coming into your home, I could save you a lot of money this morning, okay? I could summarize every Hallmark Channel movie that's ever been made. Boy meets girl, they fall in love, getting married, roll the credits. It's just that simple. Maybe you could throw in a stray dog, a rebellious teenager, maybe a horse. But other than that, it's all the same. It is all the same. And I'm, I'm, just, you know, I'm just not into that. Uh, my, my family was watching the film Old Yeller the other day while we were driving down the road. And you know, I got to tell you, Old Yeller is just my kind of film. 
I mean, there's enough realism in it. Now, you understand all, all things that happen in life don't have a happy ending. You do understand that, right? And Old Yeller kind of reflected some gritty manhood in a boy who has to take control of some things and has to overcome some obstacles and has to deal with some real-life hardships. I thought, you know what? This is just a gritty movie. This is my kind of film, you know? And, uh, but the Hallmark Channel, eh, not so much. And so sometimes you might see my mother-in-law watching one of these films films and she might be sitting there and if you notice at the proper time there might be a tear coming out of her eye and the question might be asked is this woman really crying at a movie because we know that everything in a movie is fake it's, de it's designed I mean the music comes in at the right time it's all designed to manipulate you we know that we're adults here nevertheless my mother-in-law sometimes cries at some of those Hallmark movies. Now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I have a friend, lives in Virginia, and he has a favorite football team. Sometimes the football team does well, and sometimes they don't do so well. His wife has been known to go to him after one of those latter games that did not go so well, and she has looked at him and she has said, is that a tear coming out of your eye over a football game? Now, some might say of my mother-in-law that she's a person of a tender heart. Some might say regarding my friend that, who cries at football games from time to time, maybe they might say that he's a person of a tender heart. You know, whether, whatever your definition of a tender heart is, and whatever my definition of a tender heart is, I suppose that's okay, but really, it, it doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things. We want to know what God's definition of a tender heart is. You see that? So you can have your idea and I can have my idea and maybe we can discuss it over coffee, but it's not going to change the world. But I'll tell you something, we better know how God defines a tender heart. And the good news is, we have a man in this passage of scripture, I didn't say he was tender hearted, you didn't say he was tender hearted, God said he was tender hearted. And furthermore, Pastor Olheiser, the Bible not only tells us that he had a tender heart, but it gives us three key descriptions, three activities that kind of define God's idea of a tender heart. Well, that's very helpful. So with that in mind, let's look at verse 19. The Bible says, here it is, because thine heart was tender. No more discussion about that. Josiah was a person of a tender heart. But how do we know? What does a tender heart look like? And I believe following that, those words, thine heart was tender, we have a threefold description of things that he did because his heart was tender. So here we go. Because thine heart was tender, God says, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord. Now I have an outline, but... Pastor Gritton, the longer I preach, the more my outline sometimes gets in my way. Does that ever happen to you? Sometimes I think, you know what, just throw the foolish outline away. I'm ready. I need to preach the Bible. So I do have a fancy outline, okay? But we're, gonna, we're just going to look at these words. These words are the important ones. So here's what the Bible says. Thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord. If you're an outline kind of person, I call that Submission. Submission. Thou hast humbled thyself. Now, what is he saying? He's saying, that, he's saying this. Josiah was willing to voluntarily rank his ideas beneath the ideas of the Lord. Everybody has an opinion about a lot of things. Okay, If you are involved in the modern phenomenon of social media, you will understand everybody has opinions. You know, the, the, the opinions people have may be ill-informed. They may be illogical. They may be unreasonable. They may be absolutely foolish, but that doesn't uh, prohibit most people from expressing their opinions. And they want to tell you your opinion. Well, here, here is a situation in which Josiah had opinions and God had opinions, but the Bible says that Josiah's opinions and God's opinions didn't match up. So what did he do? He voluntarily took whatever he had been doing, whatever he'd been thinking, and he said, that's not important. What God says is more important. So I'm going to move my ideas down here and I'm going to move God's ideas up here. You know, Pastor, I have found that is becoming very, very difficult for people to do today. People look at what, oh, well, I've always thought, well, with due respect, 
It doesn't matter what you've al always thought. It matters what God says. Amen. Do you understand that today? Well, you know, I was raised. Well, well I I'm glad you were raised a certain way. But that really doesn't matter. It matters what the Bible says. Amen. It matters what God has to say on the subject. And I will tell you this, the ability that we have to humble ourselves is the key to the blessings of God upon our life. That it, that, the more I study the scripture, the more I, I am convinced that my humility is the gateway to God's blessing. Here in this, here in this church, we have a nursery. Okay? The nursery is not attached to the auditorium. There's a reason for that. You, maybe you've been in a church before where, for whatever reason, the parents decided, I don't want to keep my children in the nursery. Uh, I'm going to keep them with me in the service. I don't know the different motivations that people might have for that, but the truth is, from a preacher's perspective, that makes things very difficult. Because there is no amount of personality and no amount of illustration and no amount of of charisma, pastor, that I have that can compete with a 16-month-old child. Maybe you've seen it before. They get up on the back of the pew. And they have their back to the preacher and they're looking at the congregation. Well, I don't care how spiritual you are. You're not going to be looking at the preacher at that point in time. You're going to be looking at the kid. And toddlers, toddlers know this. They know it instinctively. They know what it's like to have an audience. They may grow up to be the shyest, the shyest adult you've ever met in your life. Uh, but I'm telling you, while they're a toddler, they're a, an absolute ham. They're performers. They know it. So they get up on the back of the pew. They see that people are watching them. Ah. They can't speak English yet, but that's what they do. Somebody snickers a little bit. They laugh a little bit. So what do they do? And pretty soon, you don't have any idea what the preacher's talking about. Why? Because our hearts as human beings are melted by a little child. You've seen it before. You know what it's like. Somebody's walking through a restaurant. I, 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 well, I, in December, I was with a friend of mine. They had just had a little baby. I think the baby was maybe, maybe six months old, maybe eight months old. I can't remember. Something like that. In the car seat, sitting there in the restaurant. Total strangers interrupted their schedule, stopped what they were doing, and came and put their hands all over this baby. It wasn't their baby, but they were putting their hands all over my friend's baby. Now, why do they do that? Because your heart and mine is absolutely swayed and melted by a little child. That's the way it is. Now, when they get to be four and five and absolute brats, maybe not so much. But when they're, when they're in those early stages, I mean, it just, it just does something to us. It just, it just moves us. Are you listening this morning? I'm convinced that God is moved in the same way by a humble heart. I'm convinced of that. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Oh, I can multiply scriptures to you. We could talk about James chapter 4 and verse 4. We could talk of 1 Peter 5 and verse 5, both of which I just quoted for you. We could speak of 2 Chronicles 7 and verse 14. If my people which are called by my name shall humble themselves. It all starts there. And pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked way. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Pastor, sometimes people come to me and say, well, you know, Brother Paul, that passage of Scripture was written to Old Testament Israel, not the New Testament local church. I understand that, and I, I, I get what they're saying, and I, I, there's a, an element of agreement. I, I realize I must preach that carefully as an evangelist. But I want to ask you, when has it been a bad time? In what dispensation, in what theological division has it been a bad time for mankind to humble himself? When has that been a bad idea? 
Does God look and say, I'm sorry, you're in the church age. We're no longer in the, the age of, of Israel. We're no longer in the age of the law. I'm sorry, you humbled yourself 5,000 years too late. No, I don't think God has ever said that. As a matter of fact, I think at any point in time, in any person's life, when God sees humility in you and God sees humility in me, he is unable to resist it simply in the same way that we're unable to resist a little child. So God bends, so God, God, God comes down in a unique way when you and I humble ourselves before him. Here's a man in our story. The Bible says he was a tender-hearted person. How do we know he was a tender-hearted person? Because he humbled himself before God. I want you to notice there's a second verb here. There's a second verb here. The Bible says, verse 19, because thine heart was tender and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof that they should become a desolation and a curse and hast rent thy clothes. There's the second verb. The, what is the first one? Well, thou hast humbled thyself. What's the second one? Thou hast rent thy clothes. If you're looking for a point in an outline, I'll call that admission. Admission. The first one, thou hast humbled thyself. Submission. The second one, thou hast rent thy clothes. Admission. Now, if you've read your Bible from time to time, you will realize that, from time to time, I hope you realize Read your Bible like every day. I hope that's the time to time that we're talking about there. But at any rate, if you read your Bible, you will realize that many times in the Scripture, people rent their clothes. That means they tore them, okay? But you may not understand the significance of that because it's something that we don't do today. Let me just remind you of some things. First of all, in Bible times, clothing was a whole lot more difficult to obtain than it is today. Okay? Uh, several reasons for that. Today, we have machines that will weave fibers into fabric. Today, we have machines that will take those fabrics and put them together and bind them together, sew them together, so that we can really make some garments very, very fast. It wasn't so long ago, I think it, I guess it was January or February 1, that we were in downtown Los Angeles in the fashion district. Now, most of what you and I would see in the fashion district is not fit to put on your body, on my body, or anybody else's body. But there are some places in the fashion district where you can buy clothes very inexpensively. For example, my son had his suit that he's wearing now. He had it, some tailoring work done, and they charged me $5 for that. I don't know of another place in America where you can get tailoring work done for $5. Maybe there is, but I don't know of one. These tailors were amazing in that they were using industrial sewing machines. Anybody ever seen an industrial sewing machine? My mother used an industrial, or a, 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 just a normal sewing machine all the time. You know, and she would sew things, and that, that's, just, that's just the home I grew up in. My wife sews a lot of things with a sewing machine. But an industrial sewing machine, 1,300 stitches per minute. Yeah. It is literally a blur. Okay, it's done. I looked at that and I thought, may God help the seamster or seamstress that gets his or her finger caught in that thing. I mean, that, that, that just blew my mind. But in industrial sewing, we have industrial everything now. And the, the truth is, all of those things can be done so much faster today. Well, in Bible times, that's not the way it was done. All of those fabrics had to be, they had to be woven, spun by hand. They had to be put together in a loom. It just, it just took a lot of time. So that clothing was far more valuable in Bible times than it is today. We recall the story of Samson, right? He put a riddle to the Philistines. And uh, he said, if you answer my riddle, then seven days, by the time the sun goes down, then I will give you 30 changes of raiment. That's a lot. That's not like going out and buying... 30 Hanes t-shirts and slapping them on the table and saying, help yourself. That's not what he's doing there, okay? This cost a lot of money. It was very difficult to come by. Remember Gehazi, he came in and, uh, and Naaman off Elijah, Elisha, five changes of raiment. Gehazi ran after him and said, you know what, uh, don't give me five, but just give me three. And Elisha was upset about that. Why was he upset about that? Gehazi was trying to, he, he, was, he was living for the lust of the eyes. That's what was going on there. 
And so, and so uh, clothing in Bible times was much more difficult to come by, and it was much more valuable. I could go on, but the reason they were gambling for Jesus' garment at the foot of the cross, his garment was valuable. And so on we have in the Bible times. And so in Bible times when they would take hold of their clothing and rip it apart, it was a significant thing. They would do that when they were dis distraught about some news they, were heard, they had heard. They would do that when they were under conviction. But all of those were important things. And here we have this man, uh, Josiah. The Bible says he was a man of a tender heart. We know that exhibited in his humility. We know that in, exhibited in the fact that he rent his clothes. What does that mean for you and for me? I do not expect anyone during this meeting to come to an altar and go, <sighs> I don't expect that, okay? But whenever the people in Bible times rent their clothes, it sent a me an outward message to everyone. That outward message was, there is a problem, and I need to make it right. So that's why I refer to it as admission. Here's what they were doing. By rending his clothes, Josiah was unafraid to publicly acknowledge a spiritual need. You know, Pastor, it's fascinating to me that with social media as it is today, people seem to be unafraid to flaunt their sin. but more and more afraid to publicly acknowledge a spiritual need. Did you know that part of a tender heart is saying, I don't care who knows about it, I'm going to get right with God. I don't care who knows about it. There are some people that criticize me and criticize this church and others, others like us who believe like us. They would criticize us for still utilizing a public invitation. And maybe there's an invitation given at this church every single service. Maybe it's every Sunday service. However the church chooses to do it, that's fine. But I promise you, there are times when there is a public invitation given at this church. And I'll promise you this, every message that I preach, except for this Sunday school time, there will be a public invitation given. You say, Brother Paul, don't you know that people can fake things in a public invitation? Yes, I do know that. Have I seen people that fake a public invitation? Yes, I have. But let me tell you, there's nothing like an opportunity to, to, to just put everybody else aside and say, you know, if I must rend my clothes to admit this, if I must step out of my place and come forward to admit a spiritual need, I don't care because I am more interested in being right with God than I'm interested in what anybody else thinks about me. And I'm telling you, that is an important part of a tender heart. We've got people today that want to say, well, you know, God's spoken to my heart, but I'm just going to keep that private. And listen, some decisions that you make before God are private. I'm willing to give you that for the sake of argument. But I'm going to tell you something. You cannot convince me that in 15 years of Pastor Gritton's preaching, God has never spoken to your heart. You can't convince me of that. Why? Because he's a great preacher. I've never heard him preach. But I'll tell you this. He preaches a great book. And it is in that that I have all the confidence in the world. And I will tell you this, there are times, Pastor Olheiser, I get up and I preach to teenagers along these lines about having a tender heart. They haven't seen mom or daddy go forward in their lifetime. Now, I'm not saying it's something that you fake, but I'm saying this. If God speaks to your heart, I mean, let's be unaf unafraid to publicly acknowledge a spiritual need. And the Bible says, when this man did that, it was, it was part of his tender heart. The Bible says this in Psalm 51 and verse 3, I acknowledged my transgressions unto thee, and my iniquity have I not hid. Sometimes we come to the house of God, we want everyone to think that everything is just fine, and all I'm, everything is, I've all put together, I'm all physically put together, I'm certainly spiritually put together and all that. There, there are times when we, we want to give that impression, but there are times when a very hurting heart is being hidden behind all of that. And let me tell you, there are just times when we have to come clean and say, look, I wish I could say, when, they asked, when asked how I'm doing, I wish I could say that I'm fine, but the truth is there are some needs that I have. 
it's, it's, I'm not preaching that you should tell all of your problems to every single person every time they ask you. That's not what I'm saying. But I am saying that it is a mistake to hold out and to not get help for things that may be plaguing your heart today. And many are the times that your pastor has noticed some things play out and he has looked back with grief and said, if only I had known that was going on in their heart, I would have come. My wife and I would have come on a special visit. We would have sat down with them. We would have helped them. We would have opened the scripture. We would have prayed for them. And it is a mistake sometimes to bottle that in because there are people in this church who desperately want to help you. Furthermore, there's a man in this church that's called of God as a shepherd who lives to help you spiritually. That's his life. And so here's a man of God. The Bible tells us that he was a person of a tender heart. How do we know? Well, he humbled himself before God. How do we know he's a person of a tender heart? Well, he was unafraid to publicly acknowledge a spiritual need. We see that in that he rent his clothes. I want you to notice there's a third verb. The Bible says, Thou hast rent, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. Thou hast rent thy clothes and wept before me. What does that? Well, for the sake of outline, I call the first one submission. I call the second one admission. I call the third one contrition. Contrition. What do I mean by that? Well, here was a man that was weeping before the Lord. Specifically, it means this. Josiah so allowed God's truth to impact him that his emotions were unreservedly involved. Now, I understand people show emotion in different ways. I happen to be from the South, okay? And, uh, and we just, uh, when North Carolina lost the basketball game this past week, it was a sad occasion for my family. I don't know that anybody was crying, but I mean, we were, we were really bummed. And we were really, really, really bummed because they don't have a football team. I mean, it's just North Carolina basketball is it. And uh, so now we, our, only cho our only chance left in the ACC is what, the Duke Blue Devils in the tournament? And uh, you say, Brother Paul, are you that much of a basketball fan? Well, during March, yes. And I know March is almost over, but we really, really love basketball. And I got to tell you, when we're watching the game, our emotions are unreservedly involved. My wife did not grow up watching basketball, but I have noted my wife in recent years yelling at a television screen, emotionally worked up. Now, the people on the other side of the television camera, they can't hear her. And even if they could hear her, whatever she says is probably not going to affect their decisions. I mean, the refs made a call. It may have been a good call. It may have been a bad call. But he's not going to change that call. And that's just the way it is. And my wife's yelling at the television screen is not going to change that. Okay, we understand that. But look, there are, all, there are times in everyone's life when our emotions are involved. Okay, maybe you show it differently. Maybe you don't yell at the refs who can't hear you through a television screen as you watch Illinois play basketball, okay, or football or whatever. Uh, but the truth is, all of us at some level and at some point, we have uh, areas of our life in which our emotions are involved. So some people can say, well, you know, I just don't believe in getting emotional in church. Uh, look, look, there, there are places in the South where they run the aisles. I'm not saying that a person has to do that to be right with God, okay? I'm not saying that. But let me tell you this. I want you to get this balance here very carefully. Christianity is not to be emotion-led, right? I don't do what I do because I feel like it. I do what I do because it's right. And when I do right, then I feel good for doing it. That's the way it works, okay? So Christianity is not to be emotion-led. But hear me, Christianity is not to be emotion-less, it's not to be emotionless. There ought to be times when the word of God is being preached that you feel something. There ought to be times when the songs of Zion are sung that you feel something. There ought to be times when you open the word of God and, and you're reading it and you feel something. Hear me, hear me. There ought to be times when God speaks to your heart and you realize, wait a minute, what, my life doesn't match up with the scripture, that it gets you emotionally worked up and you realize, no, for far too long, my life has not been right. God, I need to make it right. When the, and when the... When the God of heaven saw Josiah doing that very thing, 
He said, Josiah, you're a man of a tender heart. You've humbled yourself. You've rent your clothes. You've wept before me. The Bible says this. The Bible says, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. We do not have time this morning to go to the penitential psalms of the book of Psalms. There are six of them. And all of them are very instructive. Psalm 32, Psalm uh, 38, Psalm 51, or three of the six. I can't remember all six off the top of my head. I believe Psalm 6 may be the first one in the order. But all of the penitential psalms reveal some great things for us. Psalm 38 is especially instructive. If you're taking notes, you might want to write that down. Psalm 38 is especially instructive. Because Psalm 38 describes the effects of guilt from many different angles. Now please listen carefully to what I'm about to say. Very carefully. Many people in the United States today are taking prescription medication for depression. It's just a fact. You can look at the numbers. A lot of people are taking medication for depression. I am not saying this morning that every person taking such medication has a sin problem. I'm not going to say that this morning. But in nearly 17 years of ministry, I have encountered people who were diagnosed as being depressed, whose real problem was guilt because of sin. And I will say, Pastor Olheiser, if you notice very carefully the description of guilt in Psalm 38, there seems to be a lot of common ground between the description of guilt in Psalm 38 and the, description, the medical description of depression. Again, get what I'm saying. I'm not saying everybody on depression medication has a sin problem. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying there's a lot of common ground between depressed, the, the medical description of depression and the Bible's description of guilt. The good news for guilt, guilty people, is, comes in Psalm 38 in verse 18. Listen to it. I will declare mine iniquity. I will be sorry for my sin. There's hope for someone with guilt. I wish I could tell you, I wish I could tell you that, that those things are always dealt with properly. But the truth is in 2017, after, uh, before I was here, I, I received very devastating news that a good friend of mine had taken his own life. After he took his own life and things began to come to light, we discovered here was a man that had unconfessed sin. He was, he was prescribed medication by the doctors because they said your problem is clinical depression. His problem wasn't clinical depression. It was guilt because of sin. Oh, how the story would have been different had this man who was hiding the sin, had he come to, come to some people and said, look, my problem isn't depression. My problem is a sin problem, and I need to get right with God. But you know, when Josiah was confronted with the sin problem in his life, he was so impacted by the truth of God that his emotions were unreservedly involved. I need to wrap this up here. I want you to consider this. As we, as we come to the scripture, we look at this tender heart. We, we look in the Old Testament. There's some things about some different people that uh, stand out to us. For example, when I mention the man David, maybe you think of this phrase, the man after God's own heart. Maybe that comes to your mind. But I want to ask you something. How could this man be the man after God's own heart? Let's, let's just be honest. I mean, if you're here in a college town, you're going to be faced with these kinds of questions if you go witnessing. David, the man after God's own heart, was guilty of a lot of things. We know he was guilty of adultery. Okay, we remember that, his sin with Bathsheba. Then, in order to cover up his sin with Bathsheba, he had to lie. Now, that's very common with adulterers. And then, in order to cover up the lies, then he had to murder her husband. Well, that's maybe not as common with adulterers, but it does happen. It's, it's not unheard of, even in our day today. But there are some other things that David did that are perhaps a little less known. Do you realize that during David's Ammonite campaign, he did things to the Ammonites that if he were to do them today, he would be tried by the United Nations for war crimes. 
Notice very carefully. The Bible says in the book of 2 Samuel chapter 12, in describing all that David was doing during the Ammonite campaign, he made people to pass through the brick kiln. He made them to pass under saws. Well, what does that mean? Well, you and I don't want to, we don't want to go down that road of what it actually means. Let's put it this way. It means human torture is what it means. Now, I have some theories about that. I can't necessarily prove it, but I believe that David, plagued with the guilt of his sin, not right with God at that time, ordered his men to do some unthinkable things in the Ammonite campaign. What am I saying? I'm saying if he were alive today, he would be tried for war crimes. He would be lifted up as, as another of the wicked people of our day. The Osama bin Ladens, the Adolf Hitlers, the Joe Stalins, just go right down the line. They would add King David to that list. Why then do we know him as the man after God's own heart? Do we not see that, that that represents a bit of a problem? I believe the answer to that problem lies in this. Did David sin? Without question. Just like you sin. Just like I sin. But I believe what differentiated David from so many before him and so many after him was this. When confronted with his sin, David responded with a tender heart. Every time David was involved in wickedness, he brought it before God and he responded with a tender heart. I want to ask you something this morning. Not the way my mother-in-law is. Not the way my football fan friend is. But in the way that Josiah was. Are you a person of a tender heart? Do you realize everything that we do this week is going to depend upon whether you and I come to God with a tender heart or not? Father, make us tender-hearted people, I pray. And Father, I pray that you would work in a great way in this meeting that we have here this week. We pray and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for your attention. You're dismissed.